So I can start now. Okay. Hello, everyone. We are back with another episode of Computer Vision Talks. And this time with us, we have Akshita. Akshita is a research engineer at the Inception Institute of Artificial Intelligence. She serves as a reviewer for various vision conferences like CVPR and ICCV. She has also worked as an outreach intern at Mozilla in 2018. So that could be a completely other talk where we talk about outreach. But for now, we're going to discuss her research paper accepted at ICCV 2021. Uh, which is based around multi-label zero-shot learning, which is quite an interesting topic nowadays. And yeah, apart from that, uh, an interesting fact would be that we were initially going to discuss an ECCV 2020 paper. And now, uh, meanwhile, our, uh, meanwhile, Akshita has pitched in another amazing paper. So we decided to discuss this one and, and we are sure that you'll be enjoying this one too. Yeah, over to you, Akshita, please. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm sorry I switched uh, to our ICCV paper because that's like a long time ago so that would take me much more time to like recall back everything and this is like uh, recently picking up a uh, problem statement so I thought this would be a much better fit now. So this is a ICCV uh, 2021 accepted paper. It's on uh, multi-level zero-shot learning. Uh, it's like a more advanced problem in uh, zero-shot uh, zero-shot learning, where previously people just used to focus on like um, single-level zero-shot learning. So we are not trying to explore in um, multi-level domain. So this is a joint work uh, in collaboration with uh, um, Salman Khan, uh, Dr. Salman Khan, Dr. Fahad Khan, and Dr. Ling Shan, and Dr. Mubarak Shah. So, okay. So I'll first start by introducing like a comparison between multi-level learning and uh, which is a standard supervised technique and uh, our multi-level zero-shot learning scenario. So during multi-level learning where the training data has a certain um, count of classes, which the model is trained on. And during the test time also, it's given the, the images are also of the same classes. So for example, here, the training data contains uh, uh, various amount of classes, but the test class uh, portrait and actor are also uh, the classes which the model has seen at training time. So it's easily able to predict at uh, test time the, uh, the classes. But when we switch to a multi-level zero shot scenario, where the model is forced to recognize an unseen class, which uh, uh, the model has never seen at the training time. And since it's a zero shot learning, there are no samples, but only with the help of word embeddings. So here, the ground truth labels are the same uh, training data. And at the test time, the seen uh, classes, which are now portrait and actor, and the unseen classes, which are person, nighttime, and girl, which the model has never seen at the training time, should able to predict should be able to predict those test uh, those unseen classes. Uh, if anyone has the doubt, uh, like uh, there's a chat. Okay. Uh, no, there was just a notification for questions. Don't worry about the chat. We read out the doubts. Oh, okay. So, so next we'll uh, start by explaining what existing multi-level uh, zero shot scenarios. Uh, zero shot papers are so up till now mostly in zero shot learning people focused on single label uh, on data sets like cub uh, eva which are single label uh, per image but they are not realistic in realistic scenario we will not get uh, an uh, only an image with one object so this is much more realistic scenario and um, in some of the previous works People used to combine object detectors, specifically the RPN part, where it's able to get proposals over the region with the classifier and get uh, single label, single object per image, and then classify. They used to convert a multi-level uh, problem to a single label problem. And uh, if you're not, if you're still uh, sticking up to the simple multi simple uh, framework, then if you have so many labels in the image. If you even detect an uh, object that's covering most of the area, the classifier will still give a good uh, score. So it 
but when you visualize when you see they you are still uh, ignoring the abstract and small regions so these were some of the limitations that we came across when we were looking in this multi level zero shot scenario so now i will explain one of the papers that we used as our baseline for um, for our paper so this is uh, cvpr uh, 2020 oral oral paper uh, they have a method proposed as lisa so so what they do is they learn uh, multiple attention map but those multiple attention map are shared across the categories so as you can see from the image the first image they are they are trying to learn attention map across uh, all the object it's creating the attention maps are overlaying on all possible objects it's not able it's not able to create that specific region discrimination discrimination so that for abstract that is okay for um, objects such as uh, um, house or uh, bridge that's distinguishable but for abstract objects it creates a uh, it creates confusion so and then what they also do is the spatial pooling uh, is performed over the learned attention maps. And uh, when you need to classify the unseen labels, you introduce word embeddings uh, in the training scenario at the last at the last step, so that they also learn the mapping between the seen classes and the unseen classes. So in this case, <clears throat> the spatially pooled attention maps were directly multiplied with the label space. But this, uh, since the attention, uh, since the attention map itself were uh, are not very clear, they were uh, they were confusing. After you do the spatial pooling, their class specific discrimination discriminability is lost. So as we can also see by the attention map. So this was our main um, like problem. This was the main um, problem that we were trying to solve to increase the. Uh, region level uh, discrimination to enrich the region level feature so that uh, with the for example with with the window or house scenario if you are able to classify window then with the relationship you can also identify a house or a building now i'll um, move on to our proposed method if anyone has any doubt uh, up till now they can ask in the middle itself i have no problem um, right no, so far it was clear in the background. Yeah. Okay, so now I'll explain our proposed method. Um, yeah. So what we try to do is uh, we'll try to learn category specific attention maps so that we can get the discrimination between the dominant abstract and all possible type of objects. And uh, when we focus to learn, uh, we've so many, we mainly focus to learn on the region specific um, Feature in so region specific uh, re features so in the motivation that if we improve uh, those region specific features and if we also include this uh, scene level context, which I'll explain later, we will be able to get the classifications better and the unseen labels. Uh, we will be able to classify them much better because in zero shot scenario, you mainly try to get uh, mainly try to do two things first is to learn the relationship between seen and unseen classes and try the try to uh, learn uh, try to try to make the model less biased towards the seen classes because it's already trained on that so in our case what we did was uh, we learned category specific attention maps and the top k uh, pooling was performed over the spatial dimension so once we get the enriched features region level enriched features we perform top k on that to select the best uh, region level class, region class specific features, and then uh, and then we get the predict and then we get the predicted scores, which we apply a ranking loss uh, on top of that to train the overall network. I'll explain in more detail uh, the overall architecture. This is just a abstract view of our uh, framework in comparison to the previous existing method. So now, um, so now proposed architecture. So we have a, a backbone a BGG, which we use to extract features from the in training data. And after that, we get uh, so global uh, global features and uh, region specific features. So this XR, 
is region specific feature and xg is the global specific feature so xr is further passed through a convolution layer and then we get a, the latent feature hr these two combined are uh, passed through the biome which <clears throat> which handles the which handles which combines the region specific uh, and scene specific uh, which combines to uh, improve the region specific features and the scene specific, scene specific features so after uh, after passing through biome we get the enriched features ef which we pass to a joint semantic space where we so after passing through the joint semantic space uh, we get the response maps fm so in this joint visual semantic space we multiply the, the enriched features ef with the attribute embeddings and then once we get the learned response map which also ha which also have learned the relationship between the seen and unseen we apply top k over that to get the specific uh, regions and then ranking loss is applied over all the architecture to train it and then uh, we get the and why we use the ranking loss because we want to rank the classes so the positive classes should get a separation from the uh, negative uh, classes so by negative classes i mean some classes will have very lower score but they will still try to come in the prediction so we uh, we try to rank them lower in comparison to the positive uh, classes now i'll um, explain our top k pooling procedure so the response maps which were uh, learned after the joint visual uh, visual space we apply uh, we select top uh, 10 uh, top 10 uh, class specific features over these um, response map and then why we do this top k because uh, we instead of combining all the spatial uh, all the response map we we found out through our um, experimental results that uh, taking the uh, taking top k out of those is uh, better to get those uh, separation and then when we get the learned prediction scores further uh, ranking them is much better uh, alternative as compared to going all together okay so so our module biome comprises of uh, two modules um, rcb and scb so rcb is region uh, contextualized module and scb is scene contextualized module where so first i'll explain um, rcb so <clears throat> so learned um so the learned uh, attention the learned feature that we got from um the feature backbone after passing it through a convolution layer we pass it through our rcv module to get those uh, so this with this module we try to focus on each region of the feature because we are focusing on a large scale data sets and you find in open images they have multiple objects in the image and that to abstract large small every every kind of objects so focusing on all regions uh, we found out with uh, helped uh, helped us getting uh, to learn the relationship between all the uh, regions once the region level features are um, modified and they are enriched and with this attention module we were able to learn uh, the relationship between all the regions in an image and then um, once this region of for example where when i explained previously the window and the house relation so when the importance of uh, window exists in an image it throughout the training it uh, it it uh, it's like it helps the network to learn what all it's associated with so if it's seen to associate with the house buildings or other possible um, uh, monuments or any other scenario 
it's able to translate that information at the unseen time also where when multiplied in the visual uh, semantic space with the attribute embedding it's able to learn that relationship and uh, so the main motive of rcv was to enrich the region level features to get the relationship between uh, to learn the relationship between them and then uh, so i read uh, uh, seen contextualized block when uh, we uh, so uh, we uh, analyzed with rcb that uh, once we perfected the region uh, specific uh, features we were able to get all the uh, we were able to uh, classify all the objects but the abstract objects were left out for example sky or um, lake um, or like um, the uh, night all these all these labels also exist in any as file so we had to uh, find we had to uh, find a module that can help us get the relationship between those region features and the holistic scene um, context so with this uh, module this uh, xg is a global feature so xg xg uh, when added adds a channel attention to the learned uh, region features and uh, with this we were able to in our residual form we were able to provide uh, the we were able to learn the connection between the enriched region features and the over and the global uh, global information so to so since it's uh, it's a module it's uh, we wanted to uh, bring it out as a plug and play module so this can um. uh, just one clarification over here, Akshita. So RCB works on local features and SCB works on the global features. Is that so? Yes. And when you're choosing out the region, I don't know how uh, lame it would be sounding. How do you decide the regions? So you mean to say at the before the top K pooling or yes, before the, top the RCB? Before the top. So, Okay, so before the top K pooling, all the regions are selected based on the score. So since uh, we learn our attention map, the mm -hmm. region which has a high object, um, which has a chances of an object being present in that um, in that particular region, it will give a high score. So we do a top K to ensure that we get a um, we get a patch or a region which has an object actually present in it instead of taking the full um, image. Full response map. I get it. Hmm. So it's totally based on the scores um, instead of uh, doing it um, manually or randomly. So do you penalize if the like if you're getting a wrong um, output for the score? I couldn't um, understand one thing that when you say that it is based on uh, scores. So did you also encounter a situation where um, you could not find an object as desired according to the matched score yes there were situations but uh, since the overall uh, it, there were situations but we didn't penalize it because if we uh, did that the abstract objects were uh, getting affected so there might be a better solution to uh, remove that uh, to remove that um, problem uh, where the is coming and of the uh, object is not there without uh, without affecting the ab abstract uh, object prediction as well but uh, for this um, but at the moment we didn't um, focus on penalizing the top pay pooling okay understandable yeah, please go ahead so this is an ablation that we performed uh, by uh, by our, uh, for our model to check how uh, what's the strength of the model what actually it's bringing to the table so we did this on the nsy data set and uh, we also uh, in our paper we have op an open images data set which is a like a large scale data set has 9 million images and around uh, i don't remember the exact number but it has around 1000 or something objects per image this nsy at training time has maximum uh, one can go up to like 150 image, 150 objects per image. So, so for this first, in the first row, we showed what happened. Oh, sorry. 
in the first show we showed what happens if we just use the standard region features standard region features uh, mean by it no without the module if we just pass the H, um, region features to the classifier uh, at the end classifier what does it perform so we and then so we like saw a major drop was coming from our final module and then when we added only the region um, region uh, uh, rcb where it was uh, modifying the enriching the region features the improvement was coming uh, from uh, from there but it was still not enough as I, as I, as i mentioned the overall global uh, abstract uh, objects were getting missed and then uh, when we combined the overall uh, rcb and cb the we got the desired improvement uh, which was able to get both the uh, both the uh, region objects and the globe and the abstract object as well then uh, so uh, the there are like um, two evaluations here so for the left one we um, rcb is um, inspired by the self attention module so we try to remove uh, the like specific uh, so uh, in rcb we, if we go into the specific architecture details uh, what happens if we do it with the layer norm sigmoid and softmax so we were trying different um, uh, different uh, um, experiments to check what's what's the strength of our model uh, current proposed model and uh, then on the other hand also there are several other attention a framework is existing at the moment which focus on this global and local um global and local relationship so we try to compare with those also uh, to show if our module is better than uh, those module so this is uh, for sorry so the right one the uh, non local and crisp cross attentions they are other form of attention which fo focus on this uh, same type of um, relationship but they how they are different from r we try to show in it uh, ablation form then, hi akshita hi yeah in uh, rcb module can you go to rcb module slide once yes this one so in this case all the dimensions of the intermediate feature maps will be the uh, fixed right they they need not vary at every step like for example let's say the output of hr the intermediate representation of the uh, each feature map will be the same they will not be changing um yes they will not change but uh, yeah. what do you mean like by changing changing in the sense the network is fixed the network is not changing based on the input image uh no input. because uh, yes because of the backbone we uh get the features uh before um hand so when you have this kind yeah. of uh, back backbone the features are initially like for we had a 5.2 cross um uh, coding was 14 so 5.2 cross 196 so that was the feature that yeah, we extracted from that, all the image yeah my query is that in an input image the scale of a particular object can be different in images for example Uh, a cat, a cat can be in smaller size or a bigger size. So, when the network architecture is fixed, how will you extract the region-specific information when the scale of the input object is changing? Because the scale of each so, object. Mm -hmm. Yes, I got it. Yeah, we have to. Yeah. So when you have these kind of images, uh, you uh, so. we don't deal at uh, exactly the image level we bring it down to the feature level with the vgg uh, backbone we extracted all the features so all the scales and all the different uh, resolution of the object or the resolution of the image we brought it down to the feature space and we got the necessary information if we have one object per image that's also fine we have the if the, where rcb is lacking we have the global um, module scb that can learn overall what the image is looking at so we brought 
everything to the feature space. So we to remove that uh, constraint of okay, the scale is different. We might have to think of something else. We are not now in the feature space in the network. Sorry, image. We are not in the image space. We are in the feature space. Yeah, especially the point being uh, exploiting the region specific information because the region itself is changing with respect to scale of the object. Yes, that's the, like the yeah. interesting. Uh, that uh, that makes the module adapt to different kind of um, if if you only pass like one kind of image uh, it will get uh, stagnant or uh, not even uh, learn to different resolution because it it will see a completely different set of images at the test time so it, we try to do in uh, we, when we bring it down to the feature space and when we have this zero shot scenario we focus on getting all these kind of variations in the image Okay, I'm good. Um, okay, so this is uh, the evaluation that we did with Open Images, uh, Open Images dataset, where uh, uh, we show a, like a big jump from the previous existing uh, method. Uh, why the big jump is coming because uh, we found a few certain um, MAP calculation um, metrics that were used. Um, open images is like quite a tricky data set. So I mean, it has like positive, uh, negative, and um, neutral annotations. To balance that, it's very delicate situation. So if you uh, if it's done correctly the results will be like amazing on this large scale data set. And uh, then we have also some attention results where we can, we have also shown that uh, the classes were so challenging. There were different varieties of boats itself. And uh, just like Nikhil mentioned, if an object is covering the full image, uh, the boat and um, the, they are covering most of the images. So you try to, with this attention map, the, like the, how should I put it? Um, the beauty of this attention map is we get to see if certain, if we are able to localize certain parts of an object itself, the model can learn the what the object looks like. Just like for dog, it's it's covering the full image, but it's uh, able to learn certain, it's localizing on certain uh, features like eyes, nose, and um, for, um, for this case, the full face. So it completely depends on how, what you're learning at the training time and what's the word embedding and uh, what the images are coming at the test time. Uh, I have also added the, so we have also presented on uh, NSY data set where we have compared with the previous approach, uh, Lisa and Fazil Tag and Consi, and we have shown a uh, um, good, um, gain from the previous results and then these are the qualitative so here the, there are two types of qualitative um, results the first one are the top five predictions so uh, where the red is uh, so the green ones means the correct prediction uh, the model is giving the red one is like the first prediction it's giving so this when we use the standard features it's able to get almost everything correct but a certain the sun looks like a balloon, so it got it wrong. And uh, similarly for the other scenarios, like trees, it's okay. And the challenging part, it, it's it's very confusing if it's a river or a lake or or a, a ocean or what. But according to the test data annotation, it's not a river. So these are the. This is also as like a sample where. The thing where uh, we are trying to show the classes are so confusing at the test time. And then we have an attention map uh, qualitative result where uh, we have shown um, the classes like statue, um, sky abstract classes, sky clouds, and statue and person are like actual objects. And um, we have also shown in terms of uh, the resource efficiency, how much the training time and uh, the inference and the flops. We are slightly on the higher end in terms of flop and inference time, 
but uh, at the training time we are covering up uh, with the like with the previous state of the art approach so is there any question yeah akshita we have a question in the comment section the question is what is the difference between jsl and uh, gjsl task can you please re explain it okay uh, uh let me see if i can try to explain with my example itself so yes okay i can explain it so uh, zsl scenario is uh, when the training data will remain same for both uh, zsl and gzsl just that at the testing time when you have only unseen labels so the the, the test sample when you have only person night time and go and you have the model needs to recognize these classes then it's a zsl scenario zsl and then and gzsl is when the seen and unseen both classes are coming together at the test time so when you combine portrait actor person night time girl these all samples when the model needs to classify it's a g that's a scenario so by g that is it's like you are trying to show how the model is generalizable it's already learned on the same classes when you give the new classes and the already um, trained classes is the model able to still able to distinguish them there we are checking its uh, generalizability okay so uh, one more question here so are there any other applications for zero shot learning in other computer vision task like segmentation um, have you come across any such work where the zero shot learning is applied to segmentation uh, yes i think so there is a neuro paper in like 2018 or 2019 zero shot instance segmentation and um, there are like zero shot detection task also and um, yes there are definitely zero shot detection task there are zero shot zero shot segmentation task also instance segmentation and um, and now people are moving towards an open world scenario which is even more tougher and a zero shot is even used in domain generalization i have seen recently i think akata's paper on that um yes there is definitely zero shot can be applied to all possible so, so when they say zero shot learning in classification so we have extra classes right so but in case of segmentation or when you say zero shot learning are they introducing new classes into the label space or what do you mean by extra classes so in this case we'll have unseen classes which are directly coming during inference the classification yes yes so yes and uh, yes so in case of segmentation so are they introducing new a uh, class labels directly during inference yes the zero shot this uh, zero shot scenario remains the same it depends now when you move from uh, classification to de detection or segmentation it becomes more tougher because then you need to localize also uh, the object and then predict also so the seg in segmentation also the new classes will come in and then you will need to localize uh, or segment uh, where those new classes are in the image okay okay got it so i think uh, there are not any question questions from the audience side so any uh, interesting things about the code how much time it took to for you to code this uh, loss function on implementation part how much time it took from ideation to implementing and experimentation part um this actually depends from like person to person so uh, for me uh, it's like uh, we are collaborating so me and the uh, other author uh, dr sanat narayan so we work as a team so implementation part and then the writing and everything so it goes from like idea discussion uh, when we have proposed we keep on uh, first we find the problem statement what the problem it took, it takes certain iterations certain meeting then we get the results after uh, so it takes around this model takes around 9 hours or something to train then after uh, those training time with every possible hyperparameter setting we based on the results or uh, whatever we had the ideas or the solutions for the problem then we discuss further so it takes approximately like this is an icc we work so we had to be 
uh, done in like three or four months. So from November to uh, February, yes, three months, non-stop three months. Okay, yeah. Yeah, when you have I collaboration, see. sometimes it can be uh, reducing the time in terms of splitting up the experiments and all. Uh, it, yeah, that also depends. So how much you are, uh, uh, mostly when you are a student and you are collaborating with the professors, you need to be sure that you are communicating well, you need to keep them updated, that the more discussions you will have, the faster it will, your problem will get solved. If you like, if this was like a thing I used to do initially when I started. If you like, if you think that we can solve everything, we are going to ask a very lame question or we maybe we are, it's like a very silly doubt. Nothing is silly. But the more we discuss, the more uh, problems come in, the more challenges come in and it, more solutions also come in. So, yes. And how did, uh, how do you, like, what is your experience when it comes to deciding the authorship? So is it the one who is running all the experiment? Is it the one who writes or like modifies the existing code base for the last paper? How does it work? Sorry, I didn't get your question. So yeah, so um, as an undergrad student, when we are writing, for the research, writing a research paper for the first time, there's a lot of debate on how to decide the authorship, right? So oh, okay. um, how does it work among uh, grown-up people? Um, I guess when, like, uh, when you're working with a certain group of people for a long time, it gets synced in. So the senior um, collaboration, the senior supervisors, they already know uh, the position and uh, there's no such fight. And uh, actually the ones that were working on the problem treatment fighting and all, um, I'm actually I've never faced this kind of scenario where there was a yeah. deciding deciding phase. Yeah, I understand. So, I'm not sure. Right, there's an interesting question in the chat. So yeah, since we are having a zero shot learning problem, so I would like to discuss this. Can this method be continually learned from sequential streaming data, like an online learning setup, learning continually? Continual learning is quite in talk these days. So can we extend this to continual learning? Um, yes, definitely. But uh, then it will depend on like a bunch of factors. What's the data set? What's the um, continual learning problem statement? Are you going to solve uh, inter incremental learning or meta learning? Or what specifically are going to solve in that? Are you going to solve simple classification? Then which type of method are you going to solve? Which um, branch or direction you will take? Um, example direction or fine tuning direction? So you can, the extension can happen, but then it depends on the direction, uh, what direction you will take. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. So, yeah, this answers. Uh, Siddharth's question as well. Okay, great. So, yeah, I guess uh, if if any one of you have any uh, doubts related to the paper, please feel free to ping in the chat. Meanwhile, we're having our uh, casual discussion about research in general. But yeah, please, please uh, put, uh, put in your doubts in the chat section in case you have any. Yeah. So, um, okay. other question. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, if you have any informal questions also, yeah, because I know how difficult is it to start in research. It's very, it's very scary. How did you end up where you are right now, working as a research engineer? How did that happen? I don't and that too, under Mubarak Shah, I have watched so many lectures by him. Uh, so it's it's quite intriguing for us. So, uh. In my undergrad, I came across like initially deep learning in my third year when I, I had an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Uh, Raman in IIT Roorkee. So there when uh, I worked for a summer, then I extended the internship and uh, could started talking with other IIT students. They are like amazing uh, students there who are like working on their own. So they know actually the uh, fight and the passion and everything. It's the the spirit is amazing there. 
and then i came to then it was the first time i came to like in the, we can apply to research lab there are organization that that hires for uh, commercial like industrial projects so i started applying to a bunch of uh, research labs and uh, this i think came up so on the cvpr jobs portal so one of the best resources to apply uh, to any research internships are like the job portals on the conference page cvpr is cv i c c v these uh, they have amazing job portals so through that i ended up here i had a initial uh, deep learning experience uh, during mm -hmm. that time frame so mm -hmm. that helped me i'm sure a lot of people won't know that uh, you can utilize these job portals as well yeah that was very interesting and uh, so yeah another question that comes up to me is that since you're already working as a research engineer do you still feel motivated to pursue a phd yes definitely so i am currently applying to the phd um, application and so i so this was the question that was going through my mind the last year itself like why a phd is needed but this year when i got the chance to lead my own uh, research program then i realized why a, why a phd is needed so that fi those five years they like give you the confidence and the when when you have to trust your gut feeling when you have to go deep in the topic to understand the so in research everything is not mostly based on okay okay the literature did this and we will do that it's sometimes a gut feeling also and i've seen so many people here they are, they trust on their gut feelings and they go with the flow based on the directions and they are able to keep up with all the literature and everything so those five years or those three years they are like life changing they <laughs> i had realized that i um, i want those uh, five years to properly do, uh, to learn that confidence to to get that confidence to trust my gut feeling and so yes definitely <laughs> that uh, the click comes in when uh, you go through a certain phase or you lead your own research project so yes. you realize that uh, only during during that time mm -hmm. yeah understandably interesting okay um so uh would it be right to ask what are your immediate plans now that you've already told me that you're planning to apply for phds <laughs> so there's no plan at the moment if someone <laughs> is is someone like the competition is so tough there are so many people around me itself i've seen uh, without a master's degree or without a graduate degree so just under awesome. undergraduate degree publishing mm -hmm. even in undergraduate some people are publishing like cvpr uh, iccv the competition is so tough it's mm -hmm. like it's like not sure if we'll get in or not so not sure what will happen mm -hmm. that's why i was saying so when you told that uh, you are going to master so it's like an life changing opportunity <laughs> i think uh, it, i think it's still not hitting me enough <laughs> once i'll be knee deep in snow then it will <laughs> come as a realization okay fine i'm not yes. at home right you know in that process yeah. you're just arranging for so many things you don't realize it right yeah the culture change when that will happen that's mm -hmm. okay so i guess our discussion <laughs> is getting boring now because people are dropping off so yeah it was quite an interesting talk not just the paper but the other things also so much relatable and uh, i guess all of us sail in the same boat at the end of the day and uh, it was it was great hosting you and i'm sure we're going to have some super amazing papers coming from you and uh, probably we'll be still hosting you after a year or two years or three years right yeah. Yeah. yes definitely and i'm sure people would be more interested to hear about the outreach experience as well uh maybe you can write a blog and <laughs> we can share it or something yeah i think i did uh, during my outreach time the uh, yeah i shared definitely a blog so yes mm -hmm. there is a blog great like, yeah that's that's also like a, because from people think like from undergrad they 
uh, we have to do all these bunch of scenarios. We just uh, during the undergraduate time, we just need to showcase we have the coding capabilities. Right. Right. So, yeah, people are into publishing a lot of research papers during undergrad years. That's nice also. Um, that's nice. Yeah. Okay, so that's it from my end. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to present the paper. Thank you so much for hosting me. It was like... Glad, it, glad. Uh, it's, it was good. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. see you. Yeah, Nikhil. Bye-bye.